Welcome back. Humans have long been searching for proof that intelligent life exists beyond Earth. In December, astronomers detected a signal from a planet way beyond our solar system. Correspondent Dan Riskin takes us on his mission to answer the question, are we alone? The cosmos is so vast. Our lives look so tiny against the endless abyss of space. Is anyone out there? And if they were, would we hear them? Only a few places in the world have a research tool so special it can listen. But it has to be really quiet. That's why 50 years ago, Canada's first and biggest space telescope was built here, deep in the wilderness of Algonquin Park. If you want to hear the cosmos, you have to listen and it has to be very quiet. No phones work anywhere close to this place. That's right. Radio astronomy is very similar to trying to listen uh, to the faintest object with the most sensitive microphone. Ben Quine is a physicist from the UK. In 1997, he came to Canada. A decade later, he and his Canadian wife, Carolyn, took over this landmark of Canadian space research, the Algonquin Radio Observatory. Today, they run the space tech company, FOF, and use this telescope to keep track of satellites critical to our communications. But there's always a chance that this dish, at 46 meters across, could detect a signal from extraterrestrials on another planet. And Ben is always listening. What would the signal look like? We're looking typically for signals like the ones that we generate on Earth, like are emitted by uh, GPS satellites or uh, UHF TV stations. If you turn a radio dial, sometimes there's a radio station. The static goes down and it becomes clear and then you hear something. Yes. Is that analogous to what it would sound like if there was a message coming from space? Would it just be a matter of being on the right frequency? It's very similar, and we want to see whether it's persistent from one particular stellar location, and that would be uh, a potential detection. What's the frequency? 4.4623 gigahertz. I got it! That got eureka it. moment has been imagined in Hollywood, like in the 1997 sci-fi classic, Contact. <laughs> But in over 50 years of searching our galaxy, Earthlings haven't yet confirmed a real signal. This is why the search for extraterrestrial intelligence, or SETI, continues. There are just so many stars and so many planets out there that surely there must be life somewhere out there. Sarah Seeger is a bona fide planet hunter. As an astrophysicist, she has discovered thousands of planets and she just became an officer of the Order of Canada. It's mostly the hunt for life that drives me. But studying exoplanets is a giant journey of exploration. Exoplanets are worlds beyond our solar system, planets that go around a different sun from our own. What do we know about exoplanets that we didn't know 20 years ago? Exoplanets are way more diverse than anybody ever expected. What we know today is that Solar system copies are very rare. Instead, there are all kinds of crazy planets out there. There are some planets so hot they could have lava lakes. One planet was discovered with two suns, Kepler-47, just like Tatooine from Star Wars. Some exoplanets are believed to be ocean worlds, like Europa in our solar system, a place even NASA calls alien. Even a rogue planet has been discovered, wandering the galaxy without a parent star. Life could exist in any of those places, but the search for extraterrestrials, until now, has been mostly focused on exoplanets that are as Earth-like as possible. Seeger finds them, which helps ET seekers point their telescopes where life might occur, the best possible places to look for a signal. We're discovering hundreds of new planets, even a thousand new planets every year. We're providing targets for the SETI searches. But how has your understanding of exoplanets changed the way you imagine life out there? Finding exoplanets has made the chance of life out there, around a nearby star, very real. 
We know of an Earth mass planet around our very nearest star, Proxima Centauri. Proxima Centauri is part of a triple star system with Alpha Centauri A and B. While it looks bright enough through the Hubble Space Telescope, it can't be seen by the naked eye from Earth. That's because it's far, 4.2 light years away, 40 trillion kilometers. If, hypothetically, we did make contact with someone there, each message would take 4.2 years to reach its target. So in a phone call, it would only be our turn to talk every eight and a half years. Now that's obviously not ideal, but going there, that's even worse. In the movies, you just fly at light speed, like in Star Wars. We have ignition. But the reality of space travel is much more sobering. We have liftoff of the Titan Centaur carrying the first of two Voyager spacecraft. NASA's Voyager 1 is the farthest spacecraft from Earth. After its launch in 1977, it hurtled through our entire solar system, giving us planetary postcards. Now, this spacecraft has gone interstellar and is more than 20 billion kilometers from Earth. And yet, still, it's nowhere near as far as Proxima Centauri. To get that far would take Voyager another 70,000 years. Radio communications are a much better option. That's why the world took notice last year when a strange radio signal came from an exoplanet in that direction. So what's got everyone so excited is that recently a radio signal was found in, in a big data set from the Breakthrough Listen SETI project that have been listening for, for signals from intelligent civilizations. That signal is still being researched, but like others before it, is probably interference from a human-made source. And yet, Seeger isn't deterred about finally knowing, are we alone? You've said that we are on the brink of finally answering this question within our lifetimes. What did you mean by that? We're on the brink of having the technological capability to answer that question. So if life is very common and life is producing signals, chemical signals, or if there's intelligent life purposely trying to send us a message, we're confident that we have the ability to detect those signs. Dan Wertheimer from Berkeley, California, has been tapping into the technology that could detect a signal since the 70s. I've always been interested in this question, are we alone? I think a lot of people are interested in this question. Probably humans have been asking this question for millions of years. But when I started learning about the computers, uh, then I could actually do something about it because SETI, the search for extraterrestrial intelligence, is limited by how much computing power you have. Wertheimer has led searches for intelligent life from the biggest radio telescopes in the world, including a massive engineering marvel called Arecibo in Puerto Rico. The 305 meter dish built into a sinkhole has attracted films like James Bond's GoldenEye and Contact. Wertheimer was working with Arecibo in December of 2020 when this happened. The 900-ton platform was already fragile from a cable snap a month earlier. The dramatic collapse left the world's largest single-dish telescope virtually destroyed. We were looking for ET when Arecibo crashed. And that telescope had been around since 1963. We've been doing SETI on that telescope for about 40 years now. It really improved our understanding of the universe. So radio waves are one way that the little green people in space might be sending us signals, but there are other ways that they might be doing it as well, lasers. Could you just walk me through the different sort of media that they might be using to, to talk to us that we're trying to listen on? Yeah, a big problem in SETI is we don't know what other civilizations are doing. And if you'd asked me 200 years ago what to look for, I might have said smoke signals. Another guy said we should use mirrors to reflect sunlight to the Martians, big mirrors. Other people suggest they make a bright circular light made of fire and ET would see that. 
Wertheimer is now listening for pulses with a multi-telescope dome that can observe the entire sky at once. So one of the things we're working on is something we call all sky all the time. It's actually a telescope made of lots of telescopes, each one looking in different directions. This Panoceti project is going to allow us to look at all the sky at once, and that allows us to look for these rare signals, these flashes that might go off, you know, once a day, once a week, once a month, once a year. What's the signal going to look like when it comes? Is it going to be a string of prime numbers or something, or is it going to be a, a, a TV show? What is it going to be? My guess is that we will be able to decode the message because they will make it intentionally easy to decode. It'll have language lessons. It'll probably contain pictures, two or three dimensional images because probably all creatures everywhere, intelligent creatures need to perceive their universe. I'm human. What are you? Science fiction imagined these language lessons in the 2016 film Arrival. While Wertheimer waits patiently to receive a message to decode, transmitting opens up a debate. Our second witness, Dr. Dan Wertheimer. Wertheimer was invited to give his view to the U.S. House of Representatives in May 2014. Stephen Hawking, I believe, made some comments about uh, contact with uh, extraterrestrials or, or other life. Your thoughts about his comments? Stephen Hawking was a theoretical physicist and cosmologist. In the 2010 Discovery Channel documentary Into the Universe, Hawking warned of alien contact. So if aliens ever visit us, I think the outcome would be much as when Christopher Columbus first landed in America, which didn't turn out very well for the Native Americans. That's a big decision about who should speak for Earth. So right now, I think we should be listening. And, and I, that's, I believe that's what Hawking would say as well. I'm going to disagree a little bit with my colleague here, Dan. I think that there's very little danger in transmitting. And if there is, we're already doing it. Some people think that it's OK to send messages out into space on behalf of humanity. And some people think that that's a terrible idea. Where do you sit on, on that debate? The problem that I have with that is that ET, if they're out there, may not have our best interest at heart. Maybe they are more interested in grinding up our planet and, and just looking for a palladium. I think that sending messages, deliberately transmitting, advertising our existence may be putting Earthlings at risk. If you want to do some kind of risky research, it shouldn't be right up to a, a couple of people with a transmitter. It should be a decision for all of humankind. Coming up, liftoff of the Delta II rocket with Kepler. Taking the search from outer to inner space. Here you have an example of an alien organism on its own planet. When W5 continues. There is some chance that in the next few decades we will get a signal from some spectacularly distant, spectacularly exotic civilization, and everything on Earth will, as a consequence, change. That was Carl Sagan in 1981, one of the world's great thinkers on the cosmos. Well, it's been 40 years and still no proof of a signal from aliens. But scientists are listening, using radio telescopes, watching for pulses or fast radio bursts, pouring through data. The search for extraterrestrial intelligence has often had a boost from the rich and famous. Director Steven Spielberg funded the ongoing search in the 1980s after making films like Close Encounters of the Third Kind and, of course, E.T. Yuri Milner is one of the most successful investors in the More world. More recently, Russian tech billionaire Yuri Milner pledged $100 million in 2015. Thank you. going to hunt for intelligent extraterrestrial life. Why go for this very literal moonshot now? Why is the timing right? Well, other than uh, that it was my childhood dream, it became clear now with scientific rigor that there are probably 20 to 40 billion Earth-like planets uh, just in our galaxy. 
and lift off of the Delta II rocket with Kepler. And while planet hunting missions like the Kepler Space Telescope and the TESS satellite find exciting targets with conditions that could spark life elsewhere, other scientists are exploring proof of alien-like creatures right here on Earth. We often talk about cephalopods and the octopus as aliens from inner space, inner space being the ocean. I mean, the animal's absolutely bizarre. Until we find aliens, our best guesses about what might evolve out there will have to come from what's evolved right here. Roger Hanlon has been diving under the Earth's oceans for 40 years. He's one of the world's top researchers of the octopus, a creature with three hearts and nine brains. It's a very strange body organization. Everything about their body organization and even their brain organization is dramatically different. Their eyes look a lot initially like a human vertebrate eye, but internally they're totally different. They can see polarized light, they can't see color, they have very good visual acuity and they can see well at night. Their skin is remarkably different. Their skin is among the most beautiful skin of any animal, and they can change it too. Every one of those 200 suckers per arm has 10,000 neurons in it for taste and touch and mechanical control. And it can twist this way or that way anywhere along the whole appendage. It's no wonder Hollywood has often imagined the octopus as alien. Writing it into blockbusters like Prometheus and Men in Black. Oh, man. Oh. Now, you've been studying them for decades, trying to get a grasp on how they think and how they behave. And here we are looking for a signal from space. And so when you think about how difficult it is to understand intelligence in a different organism here on Earth, does that give you any thoughts about what it's going to be like to try to understand a message that might come from beings outside our planet? Well, yes, I think here you have an example of an alien organism on its own planet, and it's adapted very well. So I think that concept of it occurring on a different planet is entirely feasible. Life can thrive even in the most hostile of environments. A fact proven by a discovery here on Earth of an alien-like creature surviving under the Antarctic ice shelf. If you want to talk about the aquatic environment, and you know, our planet, life started in the ocean and evolved in the ocean before land, the same thing could happen on another planet. There are no rules there, <laughs> at least not the ones we understand for the beginning of life, uh, but I definitely think that this could happen, and it might be something as strange as an octopus. Humans have been living on the edge of space with a window to the universe for 20 years now. Astronauts have seen shooting stars from above, and some even think they've seen UFOs. The prospect of an interstellar visitor is not that far-fetched, which is why the world took notice when what is believed to be a cigar-shaped space rock, roughly the size of the Eiffel Tower, came tearing into our solar system at 96,000 kilometers an hour in 2017. It was Canadian astronomer Robert Warrick who first spotted it, an object called Oumuamua. At first it appeared just to um, look as a normal near-Earth object would. It was only after it was found on additional nights that we could determine the speed, and it ended up being much faster than possible for, for our sun. Too fast for our sun's gravity to hold on to it, Oumuamua is just passing through, an interstellar visitor. Those observations were made using the Pan-STARRS telescope in Hawaii. Its job is to find near-Earth asteroids that might threaten the Earth we determined immediately that this was a special object and it was interstellar. The math from the orbit told us immediately that it was out from outside the solar system. There has been plenty of speculation about the visit of Oumuamua and whether it's an asteroid, a frozen flat nitrogen fragment from a Pluto-like planet, or perhaps something else in disguise. An unidentified flying object that's now traveling out near Uranus. We're actually very convinced it is a natural object. 
and that it is more like a comet. Scientists have actually predicted these things to exist for decades, and it's just taken this long for somebody to find one. Even if Oumuamua isn't a spaceship carrying creatures with advanced messages for us to decode, the search for extraterrestrial intelligence continues. Are we alone? No, I don't think we're alone at all. I, I'm, I'm quite confident that life will be found elsewhere in the universe. I think the universe is probably teeming with life. We really don't know. All we have is this one example of, of Earth. We live in this Milky Way galaxy with a trillion planets, but there's a hundred billion galaxies. So a hundred billion times a trillion is, is a big number. I think there is life out there somewhere, just based on the sheer number of possibilities. It's only you know, in the last decades that we have been able to carry out the search. And this could be a generations long, long search. So we have to, to hang in there. And so in the remote corners of our earth, tools like these are being used by scientists like Ben Quine, deep in Algonquin Park, where Canada's jewel of radio astronomy is still listening. Whether we will find another alien civilization which communicates on the same wavelength of, of us, I'm hopeful that we'll discover that sometime in my lifetime. With technology driving the hunt for extraterrestrial intelligence, new missions are being proposed. And there's even some suggestion that NASA, which has been out of the alien search since the 1990s, might well lead the way.